Tawarwani yak Hanchol milka panda kwit Neo Sudan Bika mil nyol bai Bika panda nyar Production. <laughs> Kalau ke bini kaya cum Dam wan jatia na jon Gareng na mabil Jaka bendi Ku baga pada gue iri Jiman awan kor jon Jiman kor jagu ya de Nyali jangiran den Jica genong adon nawer Dewa konya mana Benda yu weza caket konyo Jon sonda gila tak konyo wa Wat ke bolo ale raja deng Atem miyang atin Nila bebo kwen Niu sudan abedu ka kekul ke pande Abu yar cegwe Rajan garang ama biu Ije wan aja tau Kedo keneng kenget Weje nang nyiwet ya Dua ke ceng da jamer Or mis ke jeno Dua ka kekul jalo nyuwey Victor banyak je tau Kwe ngeye webedu panda Dua ke ceng da jamer Or mis ke jeno Kukul jalu nyue Coba juga gara Atem yang atem Kayu wil bumi Kwa dua ni pindah Atem yang atem Anyot kwer Buke janyot Golik ni galam Walaupun Wat ke bolo ale reje ding Atem yang atem Mila bebo kwen Ni usu dan apa tu ka kekul ke pande Kata iwan jika nyuara Eka kindiri ni usu dan Ani mari ceng panda Eka wawa kekul Pumil ke na cila dira Aku tong da aku panda Yoke mili ceng na bekaya Jaga moto Ike bayi ni arbiya Kwe na kekul ke pande Kekaya kol ke garawin gwi bayi ke Nyali cangiran den cica Kenong adun nawer Ewa konya mele pinda yu Eza caket konyo Jon tonda gela ta konywa Wat ke bolo ala reje ding Atem yang atem Nila bebo kwen Ni usu dan abe duka kekul ke pande Nenom tu dan apa anda ku cabe duka kekul ke pande Wan yaro bay Wat ke bolo ala reje ding Atem yang atem Nila bebo kwen Ni usu dan abe duka kekul ke pande Nenom tu dan apa anda ku cabe duka kekul ke pande Wan yaro bay Wat ke bolo ala reje ding Atem yang atem Nila bebo kwen Ni usu dan abe duka kekul ke pande Jenuh tu dah dah panda ku cabut buka kekul ke panda wan yar bay buat ke bola lerai jeting atem yang atem mila bebo kue niu sudah nak buka kekul ke pande. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, let's start. Uh, let's start with your background. Who is Atemi Akatemi? Well, that's my full name is Atemi Akatem, and um, uh, professional I'm a journalist. Uh, I started. I joined journalism in basically in March. 1975, after graduating from the University of Khartoum. Um, I graduated in 1974 from Faculty of Arts, University of Khartoum, uh, with a general degree in English language and uh, philosophy. After finishing, I uh, I was asked by the Institute of Operation Studies to, to join them in um, studying linguistics in reference to Dinka vowel system. It was a visiting professor called Professor Saka, especially by that time on African languages. So um, they wanted somebody with a background in linguistics uh, and also a speaker of Dinka language. So I was uh, one of the, I was taken there to help uh, him investigate the, the sound system. Dinka, how system is a very complicated one. Uh, if, for example, very simple example. When you have uh, the word horn, is one. And when you have a plural, two, when you write these things, it, 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 uh, they appear the same. But in pronunciation, there is this what they call a uh, tone. A high tone or low tone will be differentiated. And therefore, you will get the, the difference there in the tone rather than in the right. So that, this was the area you were trying to examine. And later on, Summer Institute of Linguistics uh, developed that system where you have to put the thoughts on. For example, when you talk about the word ring, which is mid, a ring, a Quran, they are written the same. And when you are reading, you will not know the difference except from the context. But they made sure that they had to show a sign which will differentiate the two. So this was the area. And now when you see the modern writing of Dinka compared to the ones which was used by those people who translated the Bible many, many years back. They are different. And this one has made it easier. So I was supposed to be uh, doing that and for masters and possible a PhD. But there was some delay after we finished with the First, we went back to England, but the institute did not allow me to continue with the masters and PhD. Uh, so one day I went to the what they call coordination office. This was the one connecting the affairs of the South in Cardinal. So they had an office which was something like an embassy, and. Uh, the people running it were South Sudanese. And this is where South Sudanese used to meet those in Khartou to see those who had come from Juba to get the letters news and so on. So one day I went there when I was having a problem of not continuing with the study. Then I met Dr. Tobi Madur, Madur. Parekh was the Minister of Information in Juba. And he asked me what I was doing. I said, well, I told him what I was doing. He said, look, uh, we we have a government there in South Sudan, in Southern Sudan. And we want young people like you to go and contribute to the development of the region. So why don't you come and uh, work with us? I said, well, I will, I'll go. He said, do you have your document? And I said, oh, I would give him. I gave him my 
certificate or the that I finished from the University of California, Bachelor of Degree. And uh, that's how I went. I went to Juba. In Juba, they had uh, a weekly newspaper called the Nile Mirror, which was established earlier before in Khartoum when there was this office of uh, Southern Affairs, which was the first headed by Joseph Garan, uh, who later on was killed by the government of Nile when they were involved with the, the coup of Ahmed Alpha in 1971. And then after that, Abel Alir was appointed to the of Southern Affairs. So that newspaper was published in Khartoum. And uh, later on, when the regional government was established in Juba, the Nalmira was settled. And there were so many people who ran it as editor. One of them was uh, Michael George Geron, that I then told. And there was somebody who uh, so many people. And later on, there are now two And uh, the time I arrived there, there was Benjamin Warile was also was a graduate from the University of California. He was one year ahead of me. So he was the editor and uh, was the manager was the deputy. So when I came, I was uh, made features editor. Features editor is somebody, simply because <clears throat> I had no training in journalism. But because of my degree in English meant that articles presented for publication would have to pass through me and polish them in terms of language. Um, and then also I, I was given something like a week uh, training. Somebody came from Zambia called Bennett. There was a training center in in Zambia, where they were training the journalists from Africa. So they came to Cuba and they had a, a week long training. And the basic thing in journalism is uh, news writing, what they call uh, inverted pyramid. You know, pyramid is uh, is big at the bottom, at the base, but very narrow at the bottom. At, at, the, at the top. So the news is supposed to be inverted, meaning the, the big thing must come at the top. At the bottom, you narrow down with the information, something which is not important comes at the bottom. The most important thing comes at the top. So they call it inverted pyramid. And the journalists understand this. Meaning, when you have a story, new story. The most important thing in the story must come first with, uh, and they must answer uh, certain level news. What, when, where, and later on how. Uh, so that was the brief training I had. But uh, there were reporters. Some of them had been there for two, three years. And they knew how to write new stories compared to me. But of course, uh, the advantage of uh, the command of English language and all this. So I continued there until 1976 when we were nominated. Uh, in Khartoum, there was the, the Minister of Information and Culture, was born in Malawi. And he, he has been one of the best, I mean, one of the oldest journalists in South Sudan, training, training the, the, the U.S. And by that time, when he returned and he worked with the government in purpose, when the political party were formed, when the Southern Front was formed as a political party, he became the editor of, of uh, Vigilant. Vigilant was the mouthpiece of the 
far ahead. And this term, newspaper was really very fresh. Or the editor, in fact, is called a uh, known brave <laughs> newspaper or radio station, but the person behind it. He was so brave that he was reporting atrocities the government of Sudan was committing uh, in the south, like the killing of uh, over a thousand people during one night in Juba. He covered this story, he wrote it, that the government, the government soldiers were. The, the, they started shooting civilians, and uh, their bodies were thrown into the night. Then there were killings in Wow, the same month. And then there was a killing of uh, chiefs, about more than 10 or 20 chiefs were killed in war. And in this. Of course, he was reporting these things, and the paper used to be taken to support, or the government was saying that. Uh, these were lies, but there was justice. The minister, the, the minister of justice at that time, this was a, there was a political, the, the, there was some sort of democracy in Sudan at that time. So the, the judiciary was independent from the government. So every time uh, Bona and his newspaper were taken to court, they would, the government, I mean, the, the court would dismiss the case against the government. That, this is what really happened, and uh, and the newspaper had the right to report this. So Bona later on in the government of Nimeri, after he had overthrown the system and dissolved the political parties, and even limited the uh, the freedom of the expression of the press, uh, Bona was made a minister of culture and information, and. He started a newspaper, uh, a magazine, monthly magazine called Sudana, one of the best magazines in Africa at the time. And then he opened an institute called the Institute of Mass Communication in Khartoum. So we were the first people, we were the first batch to attend that uh, college. Uh, the people who were there included consumer neighbor. Uh, Led Chad Paul, myself, and others, and then people from the north. So we did the training for for seven, eight months in Khartoum, the first batch. And what did what did they teach us? Uh, those who might have not heard about uh, Watergate and all this, and then there was this Bob Woodward. Woodward, the, the the reporter on the news in New York Times, yeah, I mean not Washington Post, um, covered uh, revealed that this one was not. There was a report of burglary at a place called Watergate. Watergate was the name of the place where the headquarters of the Democratic Party was based. So Nixon, people working for President Nixon, sent the spies to break into the building in order to get their secret about the campaign, the election, and all this. So the report went out that there has been burglary at the, and people took it just like people trying to rob things or to steal things, but so, this man, uh, when was a reporter, just French uh, reporter, went to investigate this as a crime rather than, I mean, not something connected with politics. So from there, they discovered that this was not a normal uh, break into the headquarters of the party. And later on, they exposed it, and this led to the 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 the, the resignation of Nixon. And Watergate has now become a terminology. If anything, there is something gate, like the party gate in the UK now, we talk of gate, meaning scandal. So at the time, I mean, I'm going, I have gone too far. At the time, uh, we were, everybody wanted to become like uh, Bob Woodward. 
to discover, to expose the scandals. We were at the time, and we had lecturers coming from Egypt, from the UK, from the US. This was the theory, giving us insight into the workings of uh, general defense. And that, day, that time, everybody felt we were going to be an investigative journalist. Uh, when we came back to Cuba, uh, Koshi went back to his job as the editor of the Almira, and I was his deputy, I became his deputy. And uh, then <clears throat> they wanted to, Madinda Garang, who was the Minister of Information, uh, was planning to have a newspaper, monthly newspaper, magazine, according to him, something to be like uh, the Time, Time magazine, the American magazine you must have seen. And uh, he wanted to get a Kenyan to be the editor. And uh, Hilary Paul Logali, who was the speaker of the People's Regional Assembly Parliament there, and before that he was the minister, the founding minister of finance in the regional government. Uh, learned that I was trying actually to, I was trying to go to, to Britain to work there as a journalist. I had got a job there. Then he said, no, you shouldn't go. He went to Madinga Garang and asked him, uh, why are you getting the, the Kenyan? He said, because they have experience. He said, have you tried your local staff, the people with you here? Uh, have you tried them? He said, well, their standard is not what I want. He said, you try them, and if they fail, then you can get the... <clears throat> You get you can get your Kenyan, and can you imagine Madinga Garang happened to come from my village, and his the, the distance was about three miles away, and here is Henry Logali from Kochoria, insisting that I should be given the opportunity rather than a Kenyan. So Madinga said, "Okay, let us try him," and that's how I started the magazine called. Southern Sudan magazine, 1977. And uh, this magazine was popular in South Sudan and was also, uh, there were subscribers from outside South Sudan, including in England. And uh, I was helped by uh, somebody called Natala Olwak Akolawin, who was a minister in the office of the Executive Council is like what they call the office of the president today. And he loved writing. So he would come to help me in editing. He, he, he was a lawyer by training, he was a lecturer in the faculty of law. And by the time he was appointed minister, he was doing his PhD in law. And he was very good at uh, writing. English in particular, and uh, he was always cautioning me, don't do this, don't say Southerner, Southerner, what about, which part of, you say South Sudanese, Southern Sudanese rather than, hello, <laughs> hello, uh, uh, instead of, you say South Sudan, Southern Sudanese rather than Southerner, Southerner could be vague, could be what, and all this. So after, uh, one and a half years on the magazine, the German embassy in Khartoum, Germany was, uh, by that time, was two countries. There was Federal Republic of Germany, which was Western and, Demo and Democratic, and Federal and GDR, German Democratic Republic, which was communist. And Berlin was divided. There was the East Berlin, the capital of uh, East Berlin, of East Germany and West Berlin, inside East Germany, but affiliated to the West. So they had an institute, International Institute for Journalism. And they uh, used to take students of journalism from all over the world. 
Uh, so the, in 1978, they selected uh, from students from, I mean, journalists from Africa. I think there were two from Kenya, one from Malawi, Zambia, Somalia, Liberia, Cameroon, um, Nigeria, and all this. So they selected me without, I never applied. They selected me to, to go for that training. So I went there, it was for three months where I got advanced. Anyway, that's not the, I mean, not that, that I not to spend a lot of time on my training or whatever I did. Uh, probably you must be interested to know about how generally you know, the at the time. Right, uh, yes, yeah, so bef uh, before we, we, we talk about that, how was printing like? You know, given the you know the, the that era, that was uh, I would call it a, a area a, a era of darkness. You know, technology, but you know, before technology wasn't that much. So how was it? How was it like for you to print your your magazine? That's that's a very important, that's important um, that's an important period uh, really, and the best way you can really understand printing is to go to a museum and see the equipment they were using. And uh, the, what happened with the, <laughs> the printing at that time, the, what they called uh, some of the aspects or the, the terminologies used those days uh, re are reflected in what we use now with the computer. When you talk of uh, upper case, lower case, these were actually physical cases, drawers, drawers uh, under the, so the lower, the lower case contain, or let me call them letters. For example, like your name, Ayuen, Somole and, Somole and capital A. Capital A would be what they call upper case. And this is where you put the letters there, physical metals representing letters. And then the lower case where you have small a, uh, this is where you will have the small letters. Now, when as a printer, you will pick these letters physically and fit them into a small box and all this. And later on, when you pass, the, the ink will be put on top of that and the paper will pass there. That's what you do. To prepare a newspaper or a book, you will need not less than 15 people at different stages. The compositor, the one who, like when you are uh, using the computer, you type, you see you alone. But there, there were many people. Somebody with the boxes, where you will pick these things, the typeface, 12 point or whatever, pica, all this. And it used to be a very demanding job. And when you were designing the page, you would be using ruler and the scissors, pair of scissors to cut and paste. You talk of cut and paste, uh, just now you use the, the mouse to do all these things, but you had to do the physical thing. Cut using the, the scissors. Paste, you put the, gla the glue on the paper and attach it to the paper. This was the printing of our day. The physical page would be made on a desk. And then you will take it to the section. There is another section. And then another section until it would be taken to the machine. Then the machine would uh, roll the whole thing. Take the whole thing for folding. And then... Cutting, it was very, very laborious and time consuming. Now, what you do alone now here today used to be done by up to 50 people, different stages, each with a specialization. So this computer thing has solved a lot, a lot of problems. You can produce a book alone, except the printing, but design, typeface, whatever, you do it on your own machine. That was a printing press. 
We, the time when I joined the Ministry of Information, <clears throat> we had the oldest, print, one of the old printing presses. And uh, this was brought to Juba in the 1940s. This is where people like Gordon Apache were working. And uh, if you are, if you go to Juba, the printing press building is behind the, the Mudrea, the office of the governor of Central Equatoria. I don't know whether they, they keep the machines and everything there, but they should be there. If these people are, uh, um, if they keep archives or things for the future generation, they are there. Now, that, that was the printing press we were using for the Nile Mirror until we got the present Nile printing press, which I think by the time I was in Juba was not really working. It was donated by the Norwegians. And it was a the modern, it was at that stage was considered modern because they were using what they called photo typing, comp, photo composition, where you had something, a computer, but not as modern as this one. So that that printing has is a real revolution. From what many, many people used to do is now being done by one or three people. Uh, so that's all right. What about what about uh, reporting? Because uh, okay, of course everything is it's so easy for us. A reporter could be could be sent to Rwanda well, or Benti, or there is always a communication between the reporter and the and the and the editor back at the station. Was it easy during your time? Yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in a way, we, <clears throat> by the time <clears throat> I joined the ministry, no, at that time I was active in journalism, there was uh, some sort of development, <clears throat> advanced development, relatively speaking, at the time. Because there was what they call telex. Telex machine, you would uh, type in your uh, story, and send it straight. Of course, at that time, they did not have the fax machine which could send photos, but the text would be sent using telex. And this is what they use for news agencies. And uh, <clears throat> those in Malakal and Wow and other uh, provincial uh, areas like Rukmeir, Bor, Yambio, they would be sending stories <clears throat> from the from using the text for the telex. Telex machine had an, they had an office, a small office in Juba there in the Ministry of Information, and you would get the story. For the radio, they would get this story and then <clears throat> uh, translate it into Arabic for the Arabic section, or do some editing to be published. And then we would also use those stories for the, <coughs> sorry, for the Nile Mirror or for the Southern Sudan magazine. Um, it's a different world today where you can send the voice, the image, the everything, the text. Uh, that one was relatively difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, fast forward to, to, the, to the liberation struggle uh, period. From, from 1983, mm -hmm. did, did uh, the South, Southern Sudan media participate? How did you participate as, as a media in general, so, Southern Sudan media? Before, before the, you mean before the, <clears throat> the During the liberation before. from 1983, from 1983. From 1983. Did the oh, yeah. Southern Sudan media <laughs> help? Did it participate? Well, it depends on. We had three groups involved in the in the media war: the Khartoum, which was the government of Sudan, and then uh, Juba, uh, which was representing. It used to, used to be the seat for the whole Southern Sudan, but after the the, the, the dissolution of the regional government and the establishment of three autonomous regions, 
each one accountable to Khartoum, Radio Juba remained in Juba. And it was used it was used by how do you call it? The the the, the regional government of Equatoria for their own, I mean not for the whole South, but for themselves alone. Now, when the war started, there was misunderstanding that the SPLM, SPLA, were a reaction to the division of the South into three autonomous regions. And uh, they tried to educate the public that these people, the SPLM, are just people very angry because the country, has, uh, the, the region has been divided. The people of Upper Nile had been told to go to Malakal at their headquarters, those people from Barizal to Wau. Uh, but that, not, that was not the case. <clears throat> the SPLM and uh, John Garang, its leader, made it very clear that the reason for the SPLM to pick up arms and fight against the government of Sudan was because they were what made, what according to him, what make people angry. What are these things which make people angry? Uh, exclusion in power, sharing, um, uh, neglect, ne, ne, the areas like uh, the South Sudan, uh, Nuba Mountains, uh, Darfur, extreme North Sudan, Eastern Sudan were marginalized. It was only Central Central Sudan, meaning Al Jazeera, Khartoum, which had everything, or at least the natural resources were concentrated in developing those places, electricity, clean drinking water, everything, but the, the regions were neglected. So Garang was saying, regardless of where the country is divided, or I mean the South is divided or remain the same one, as long as those things which make people angry, uh, if, if the South if there was marginalization of the majority of Sudanese from the south and the north and the east, if there were no marginalization, there would be no war. But as long as there was marginalization, the, the war was there. Now, that was our message on Radio SPLA, uh, of which I was the, the founding director. Uh, we, I was also the editor of a news, news, uh, newsletter, which was called uh, SPLM, but not the one in Nairobi. So I was in charge of uh, radio SPLA. And uh, the role of radio SPLA was to educate the whole public, the North, the South, and the rest of the world about what the world was all about. And uh, the, the concept paper I wrote to the leadership made it very clear that in order to show to the world that we are different from Sudan or the policies, the media policies of the Sudan, we must avoid lying, telling lies. Khartoum would uh, fabricate anything. Like when their aircraft, military aircraft, were shot down by the SVLA, the Defense Force, they, they would say, oh, it was hit by lightning, which was not true. So I, I managed to convince the leadership that anybody, any commander in the South or in the war zone, trying to uh, sending a message to us to be broadcast that we did this and this and that thing was not done would not be acceptable uh, say for example if a commander claimed that they had captured a, a town like Kapoita then possibly then the media people from outside the country like the BBC would fly there to go and check 
whether the the, the SPLA was in control of the the town claimed to have been captured. And since, if it is, it was not true, and people made that uh, statement, that that would be uh, an embarrassment. So, I was lucky. They believed me. They trusted me. And also, I had convinced them that if there was a battle, they uh, they, they 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 should and. Uh, <clears throat> There were officers or the soldiers of the government surrendered. They should not be killed. They should be spared their lives. First of all, uh, killing in the military is not the objective of fighting. It is to disable, to disarm. If you disarm that uh, enemy, it, that arm is no, no longer harm, harmful. So why kill them? Uh, so when I was talking, uh, when I was uh, putting this point, Karbina Kwanyan was there, Garang himself was there, Odo was there, Martin Majid was there. And Karbina said, okay, this is the situation. Next time I go to the war front and I capture, uh, if I manage to capture some soldiers, I'll bring them to you. And he promised that. And which he did. And when this voice of the captured government soldier was broadcast. It was a bombshell to Khartoum because he was saying, "I'm." It's just like you. My name is TSA UN, and I come from this village, and this, and this, and this. And people like were listening. He said, "This is not a fake story. This is true." It was a bombshell. And then he came to me and said, uh, "What is it?" Uh, uh, are you happy? I said, yes, I'm happy, but this is a very small person. If you bring a senior officer, I would be happy. So he went to Southern Blue Nile. Then they had a class there, and then he captured Lieutenant Colonel, which was his rank also. And then somebody, Malazim Owl, that's first lieutenant. He brought them to me. It became a routine. So the SPLM was trusted. Whatever, he, whatever we broadcast, but anyway, let me tell this story now, since this is history. There were lies, there, there, there were lies, which we didn't know. The SVLM uh, never gave the figures of their losses. Once they had, they would talk in, they would reduce the number of their losses. Uh, and there was no way we could check this because the information used to come direct from the field to the commander in chief, who was John Garan. And he would go over the document, remove whatever he didn't want us to know, and then he would pass it to, to me. Then we would go and do the editing. No casualties on our side, and the government losses were there and there, and all this. There were also lies which uh, sometimes we broadcast. Somebody said uh, they, uh, one of the commanders, and I'm not going to name him, he said they, they attack at, uh, one of the district headquarters. And uh, we broadcast that story. Now we had friends not re friends, real members of the SPLM in Khartoum, those people who were supporting the SPLM in Khartoum, they, of course, they were doing it uh, secretly, otherwise they would be in trouble, uh, came to us in Addis Ababa and said, look, you people, uh, don't, don't lie. L lying is not good. Don't do lying. He said, that story, the one you broadcast on Christmas Day, that you attacked your forces attack uh, the town of so and so. We were in that town. There was nothing like that. There was nothing like that on Christmas Day. Maybe they fired some of their uh, whatever outside there, but never in the city, in the town where we were. So there were some of these things. And, and Commander in Chief Garang himself. May, he did not know this. He trusted these officers that they would always say, send him the right information. Because it, 
it was a way of uh, somebody building their prestige and their image that they were doing a good job. They were fighting the enemy and they were doing this and this. But there were lies at a certain stage. We could not stop that. But any lie we knew was uh, something we knew it was to be a lie. We refused to broadcast it and all this. Uh, there were also problems with the song. The song were composed in the field. They would just pick your name, for example, and say you are uh, an enemy, simply because you, are, you happen to be in cartoon. And then you tell them, look, uh, this is not true. And it would be difficult to, because it was already recorded. Because their assumption was that anybody who had been in government in South Sudan or in Khartoum and was a Southerner was an enemy of theirs, which was not true. And the case was, uh, let me elaborate it better. Lawrence Walwal, <clears throat> who was the governor of uh, Bargasal, uh, staged a demonstration against the SPLA and the, the image of John Garan was banned. And Lawrence World World people made a song against him. Lawrence World World Jayanyagad, all these sort of things. Now, some of these fellows within the training camp and possibly from the areas of uh, World World made uh, songs against some politicians from other areas that these people were Nyagat. And, and they had no evidence of hostile activity of <laughs> those people against the SVLM. And then we, they brought the song to us. We said, but we cannot uh, play this because this person, as far as our knowledge is concerned, is not against the SVLM or its objective. No, 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 no. And then why did you use the, why did you play the one of Lord of the World War? Anyway, <laughs> it's a long story. It was not an easy job. Yeah. Oh, but that, 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 that was a great general thing. And somebody called uh, Philip Kornman is, is, is watching. I don't know if he mentioned. He didn't mention his, uh, his current location. He's called uh, Philip Kornman. He's asking mm -hmm. a question. Mm -hmm. what, happened, what happened to Radio SPL, SPLM? I understand you, you later on you, 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 you went abroad. But, but you, maybe you know something about it. What happened to that radio? Is it still there or well, what happened? We didn't have a radio station as such. The equipment, you know, radio station, I mean, uh, broadcasting uh, system. It's not an easy thing. You can get this FM station, like what you have in Juba, what you have in Torit, in Bor, in all this, uh, this FM sort of thing. The one we were using, the transmitter we were using, was a very highly yeah, a sophisticated system. It was heard all over the world. And the SVLN did not own it. It belonged to another country. And this is why they used to call it clandestine radio station. Uh, that country allowed us to use their, their uh, system, their transmitter their studios where you would record our programs and give the, the tape to the, the their technicians to broadcast when our time arrived. And that's what happened. Now, after we lost uh, our presence in Ethiopia, we left. The day the, the rebels, the Ethiopian rebels entered Addis Ababa. That was the day we lost the, 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 the capacity to broadcast. And then while we were staying at Addis Ababa, somebody sent me a message, radio message. Why is the radio not on air today? And the BBC was announcing to the rest of the world that the, the capital has, had fallen to the Ethiopian rebels. And it was obvious that we wouldn't be broadcasting that day. Uh, so we lost it. Now, after coming to South Sudan, Southern Sudan at the time, 
there were efforts to get a, an equipment. And I think somebody brought a junk sort of equipment and which was put at uh, Imatong Mountains, around Imatong there in Kochoria. But it did not cover a lot of the space. It did not work actually, even for the, for the first time. So we lost the, the radio, which was a very powerful weapon. And Khartoum admitted it, that after the, the loss of radio SPLA, the SPLM, the movement, has lost 50% of its capacity, which was true uh, because it was all the time I mean, uh, dismissing the lies from Khartoum, was telling the world about what we were doing, that we were for a political solution rather than military solution putting us at a better light than those people who were determined to crush the movement. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, before uh, we go for a short break, yeah. uh, what about the, the media situation? You know, you were a journalist during the Civil War, and of course, uh, you were reporting from from the areas that were under the control of, of SPLA, SPLM, but still you were under the Sudan, the Sudanese government. What, what was it like to be a reporter during that time? Oh, you mean the time when we were in uh, the, uh, working with the government? In the jungle, in the jungle, yeah. You mean in the bush? I mean in the bush, you, you know, like you're a reporter reporting about the violence, I mean the conflict, the civil war. Mm -hmm. How was the government uh, treating you or your journalists back then? No, I we I didn't. I was not seen as uh, an independent uh, journalist. I was part and parcel of the system. Not only just a part of the system. I was a commission officer. I was trained as a as a an SPLA officer. Uh, when I arrived. In uh, 1970, 1984, in May, the the SPLM office was in uh, Ethiopia, and uh, the political wing, uh, led Joseph Odoho was the head of the political and foreign affairs committee. Uh, Martin Majid was the head of the legal affairs and civil administration. So I fell directly under the office of the political affairs, and uh, I was in charge of the media. Uh, Major Alfred, uh, Labo, uh, Alfred Ladobora was the head of the ideology. So we were part and parcel, not just a journalist reporting for what other people were doing. We were I was reporting what we were doing. I was part of the system. Uh, I was supposed to be trained and uh, the first badge called Shield One, where Yekmachar and Alfred Ladogor were trained. And if I had joined them, I actually was in the list. I was in number one in terms of alphabetical order for those taken to be trained as officers. I was pulled out because the radio was dead. I did not yet gone on air. So I had to go to, to complete the preparation for the radio. And these people, uh, Riek and Alfred, went and did their training, and they were commissioned uh, majors. I would have been commissioned a major because by that time I had got my masters. I got my masters before Alfred. I mean, uh, before well, when I joined the movement, I came first. Riek would had also masters. He, he had not yet got his PhD. He went back to, to Britain to get his PhD. Now, when the second batch came what they called chain two. I was taken there and that was the time the mayor was being overthrown and then they said no. But to handle this delicate situation needs somebody of your experience. So I was pulled out of chain two. Only, only to be brought to chain three. Chain three, we underwent training there with people like uh, Mark Newport and others, that Majora UN and others. Philip told me away. Now, after that, can you believe 
I was commissioned in Awal. Then when they won for this person was supposed to have been with uh, the other people. So okay, if you want to, to make him if you want to give him a junior position, okay. Let him be Mulazima one, but that is the one. So automatically I became captain. After training for five months, because we our training was delayed for two months. So I was a train officer. Uh, I was not an independent journalist reporting things happening or being done by other people. I was reporting things of which sometimes I would be even part of the, the, the event, like the Okadam conference where I took, play, I took uh, part and so on. So there was nothing like uh, whether being treated, uh, whether there was, I had the freedom do what I wanted or I didn't have to. The very se the senior people and the leadership, sometimes I would be discussing with them some of the things to be said or something to be, even not to be broadcast. I remember I was trying to interview Major Salva Keir at that time, a member of the uh, high command, and he was all the time refusing to be interviewed. So one time, in the presence of John Garanga, I also wanted to interview him and say no. And he told Garang me that the reason he was reluctant to give interview that anything said on the radio would give the enemy some tool to for their benefit. Garang said, well, the whole intention of you being interviewed is to to give you the opportunity to be known to the public who you are and he accepted to be interviewed and he talked very well and people were surprised why he was not always talking so i was part of the the game i was not reporting as an outsider all right uh <clears throat> dear viewer well, we are going to take a short break and when we come back to uh, the, the next sec uh, uh, section of the interview with Revolver around today's media situation and the importance of, uh, of, of the media in South Sudan. Yeah. Well, take it up from there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want me to comment about the, or we go for a break? It's a break, yeah. A break. Oh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 
cold sweat, blood and tears shed for the peace of rain in the land and no. It wasn't in vain, let the people sing, let the people dance, let the drums play, let the sun be loud, let the birds sing, what cannot be heard, a cry for me to heal this land, oh, heal this land. Africa Wild Book stands with a vision to educate, empower, and cement a peaceful foundation encouraging veterans to share memoirs, pen to paper, to have a culture of reading, research, and debates, learning from the past to forge a future, let our children grow up in peace, let our families know no more, let us celebrate our martyr day in the independence and freedom that we now have. out of my day i could maybe spread my bed then take a bath then sit down and joke my brain a book or two a pencil as my tool taking note of who i want to be i start my day by planning for my future in the now then i have to stop wait take a little minute think of everything my parents for me to help me be the best of me that that could ever be every time they buy me books from africa was books i take a seat and leave through the pages and draw lines note and learn make sure that i do my very best for me I get to listen to my teachers, learn all I can, then remember what I have. I catch every little fox that they try to win all of my world. Though this is true, without the complaint, Jack and Jill are dog therapy. I know that if I sleep right now, tomorrow could only be another dream. So I have to stop waiting, take a little minute, appreciate everything my parents do for me, to help me be the best of me that they could ever be. Every time they buy me books from Africa, what books I take, a seat, and leave through the pages, and draw lines, note and learn, make sure that I do my best. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Right. Yes. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. All right. Uh, dear, uh, dear viewer, this you are listening to a chat with a veteran journalist, Atim Yakatim. And me, we interviewed by TSA, and we are talking about the media situation, <coughs> media back then, and the media right now, what the media should 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 do, South, South Southland media right now. So welcome. And, and anyway, feel free to to join the, the chat. You could, you could request one, and we will add you. Or just uh, post a question, and we'll see it from, we'll read it from here. Atem, I, I hope uh, everyone understands that uh, South Sudan uh, South, uh, media situation is hostile. Uh, so many uh, 
human rights groups have, have reported on on how South Sudanese journalists are targeted. Some of them have been killed. Some some are, some are jailed. Some media houses are censored. Threatened. The 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 the, the, the print media is in trouble. Some sometimes we have seen or heard or read about what security apparatus do there. They remove some of the articles. They think they are hostile towards the the system. So. In your opinion, as someone who has uh, experience, what should what what should be the South Sudan media approach? How should how should how, what how should what should South Sudan media do? Hello? Yes. Yeah. You, you get me? Yeah, yeah. Now you are. Yeah, it's so clear. Okay, okay. Now, the, the, your question has two components. Uh, the, the most important thing should be the standard, the professional standard of the, the media, whether print or electronic, meaning radio or TV. Uh, my main problem is the professional standards of the media in South Sudan. Even before the war, I mean, during the time when we were running our press, we were doing wonderful things. In standard, in terms of the standard of the, the, the news items were written in the right way either for the radio or for the, the print. Uh, simply because, as I was explaining to you before, we didn't just, you would not just come from, it doesn't matter. You come with a degree in, uh, in mass communication or journalism. That's not enough. Never. The best journalists we had, uh, let me take you back. If you have read uh, Animal Farm, uh, 1984, by somebody called George Orwell, who was a British journalist, that fellow never went to university. And he has been one of the best writers in terms of journalism or in terms of uh, fiction. Uh, he was a journalist. He never had higher education, but he was the best. Coming back to South Sudan, we had, if you have heard somebody called Sarah Michael Weljam, he was one of the best journalists in terms of written material. He wrote very, very good uh, English. S simple sentences, short sentences, very clear, no grammatical mistakes. This was Sarah Michael Weljam. And for your information, he, when he said for Sudan certificate, in Rumbek Secondary School, he never got a certificate. But he trained, and he went and trained in India and in Sudan. If you read his newspaper or magazine at the time, you would be satisfied. This was the international standard. Why? Because he was, he trained under people who knew the job. Job, does, I mean, during our day, you did not need a degree to be a journalist. You needed, you needed somebody experienced who had been in the media for 15, 30 years to train you. So this, this has been missing in South Sudan. You come straight from university and you become an editor. Editing what? What do you know? It is, it is the only job I know which is learn on the job. It's maybe like mechanics. When you, when you become a mechanic uh, with a car, it, you do it there physically. These people, the people in Juba, I'm sorry to say this, they may have degrees in journalism, but uh, as far as the newspaper work or the radio work is concerned or TV, they are not journalists. 
the report has to conform to, if it is news report, it has to reform to a certain standard. If it is a future story, it has to reform to that. If it is news for radio, that is also, because something intended for the ear is different from what is intended for the eye. So the people who are working there, maybe they are, I can congratulate them for making it because they have, not, they have no guidance. During our day, you will not be allowed to become an editor unless you have been coach enough. The editor would come with the new stories and distribute them to the people. Look at it. Even his own editorial, he would subject it to the staff to go and look at it. Because they say one, one, one set of eyes is not enough. Maybe you, you were thinking that you were put there, but uh, some words, but may be missing. Somebody will go and pick it. Even somebody who is less competent than you. So we need the training in journalism during our time. And up to this day, it's in the newsroom. It's not in the classroom. Uh, when, for example, when we went to Khartoum uh, to do that uh, course I was telling you, it was people being, the head being filled with theories of what they used to call the mass communication theories. They have nothing to do with the story you want to write. There is also the question of ethics. Ethics, what are they? Uh, first of all, uh, things which would create problems, don't do them, don't write them. Uh, let Alfred, uh, Alfred uh, Taban uh, was one of the best journalists I know because he was very brave and he knew his job. He trained under the with the Ministry of Inform uh, Information on Sudan now. So he got coaching there and he knew the job. I'm quoting him because of a story connected with this question of ethics. So the time when I was in Juba, somebody was reported to have uh, raped a small girl, a child. And that was a horrible thing. I mean, nobody, this is a bad story. But of course, you have to write it. How do you write it? You say, somebody, if the person has been arrested and all this, you could even mention their name and what they did. But don't, don't give your opinion whether this is, this is, when it is news, don't give opinion that this is bad or this is good. or Just say what happened. Unless you are quoting somebody who witnessed the story or, or the event, don't give opinion. Just say what happened, it was this, whether it was horrible or what. Say this happened on such a, on such a date, in such a place. Um, the, the person alleged, because you have not, the evidence now, it has not been proof that this is alleged, meaning, it, not yet proof until maybe taken to court and the court uh, co confirms that, uh, convicts that this person has committed this. It is treated as suspicion, allegation and all this. So to come back to what I was talking about. So one of the reporters came with the story that such a person had committed this and this person was from tribes X. Alfred said, no. What brings the tribe there? Well, somebody has committed an offense or is alleged to have committed an offense. The question of uh, origin is irrelevant. Maybe age, because if this is a mature person doing this, this will also give you the idea. But no question of tribe. This is a very responsible uh, journalism. But I'm sure today somebody will say, yes, this person was from Tribe X. And it could create problems, by the way, in the street. People could go and fight. So this, this is also one of the things which is lacking. Scrutiny. This is story. What is it? 
and don't even confirm that this person has done this. You say it is alleged or claim and so on. So, These words are not always there in some of the reportings uh, you see or read there. Uh, and then come to English. English is a foreign language. But even the, the English, somebody born as native English speaker, always will have also to, to write it in a formal way, proper. Because you have to follow the rules of grammar. There are words whose, uh, which are said to have no, we don't take as. And you see people even university degree holders talking of uh, advices, information, equipments, aircrafts, ammunition. Where, 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 where do you get your grammar? If you if you write these things in a newspaper, somebody, uh, sensible person will say, no, 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 I cannot waste my time reading this story. It prejudices the reader. What type of uh, newspaper is this? And this is one of the problems we have. Uh, then again, coming to the question of no freedom of expression. You know, I don't... Uh, I don't endorse dictatorship. I think many people would not like this uh, control of freedom. I mean, to to deprive people of express freedom of expression is basic human right. But assuming that I'm working in Juba, where there is restriction about how far you could criticize or could say things which would displace some people in authority. I could still operate there in Juba, despite all this. What do I do? I censor myself, which is not good. It's not good. But my paper will be attractive to people because the story I will produce will be professional. And because I know I'm not free, and not even when I'm free, this attack, abusive language, is not part of journalism. What do you want? What do you want to communicate to the authorities? You want them to change a policy which you think is wrong? Don't do it by insulting them. Persuade them. Tell them if it were done this way, it would be better for you in the government and for the people. But if you say, this is complete rubbish, you must go. Even if they were ready to listen, they will not listen because it is confrontation. So confrontation has no place even in a democracy. Just explain yourself. This is my point of view. If it is for me, this thing should be done because of this and this and this. They will listen. But if you come with abusive language and aggressive words, you have you have locked, uh, you have closed the door for communication. You don't have the authority to tell the government do it. But you say, I think it would be good if it was done this and that way. Uh, and of course. I know there are times when even mild criticism will not be tolerated. I understand that. But <clears throat> if I were to talk to be talking to the journalists in Juba right now, I would tell them if you are and set, you are not satisfied with a certain government policy, there are so many ways of communicating your disagreement and it would be listened to. You, you would be listened to. There are reasonable people in any government, even if it is a dictatorial government. It is not a question of uh, heat. They have the power. They can lock you up. And they did. And they have been doing that. Uh, by the way, in Africa, freedom of expression is, uh, is disappearing gradually. And even even in the, the same countries where it used to be democratic, you could see America. When uh, Trump was even trying to, to stage a coup, I mean, this is what they, 
the, the, the action they did on the 6th of January the other year amounted to, that has been described as a coup, when he refused to, lead, to accept defeat. And this is a democratic United States. You see it, uh, Turkey, they are behaving as if they are a dictatorship. So there is a pro worldwide problem. Democracy is disappearing. In our case, it never took root from the beginning, from the time we were in the bush. We used to be told, or we used to tell other people, don't, don't do this, it will, the government will use it against us. Don't, don't wash our dirty clothes in the public. It is not good for the liberation movement to, to, for us to expose our shortcomings. Now, after becoming a government, we, we are still in that mentality. Everything, not mistakes should not be discussed. Parliament is not even questioning ministers why they are behaving this way and this way. This is not the bush. So this transition from, uh, I don't know to call it, from dictatorship to liberal democracy, it's not easy. It's not easy. I think the only countries in Africa where you have these sort of things as uh, probably Kenya, South Africa, Botswana, Nigeria. But Nigeria, despite that freedom of expression, things are not going well. People are now being taken hostage for ransom and so many things. And then the, the Islamic militants. So there is a white sort of, there is a, a concern about erosion of democratic principles in Africa. In some places, like in our situation, it never started. We have never been democratic since the, the war started. Yeah, because the the liberation movements always try to control people. If you allow such freedom, you would be even exposing the very principles people were fighting for. And then we did not prepare ourselves for a transition from uh, that situation to democracy, which was supposed to be the objective of the transitional government after the CPA, where Khartoum and Cuba were supposed to embark on democratic transformation. It has never happened. And this is, the, this is what you meant. And that environment is not, uh, is, is not friendly to, to the media. But again, under this situation, what do you do? Do you fold your and, uh, arms and say, well, it's hopeless? If I were in Juba, I still can run my newspaper. Censor myself, control what I, uh, what, what I publish, tell my reporters, don't do this, don't do investigative journalism here because there is nowhere you will publish it. And if you publish it, you will be closed down. I'm talking about the survival of the newspaper there, but they have to be professional. Not to talk about advices or information or, or uh, damages. Damages are actually what you pay for uh, destroying somebody's property or whatever. But when you destroy a building, don't say it, caused, uh, it has caused damages. Anyway. Professional standards is my concern. Even if you are in a dictatorship, produce a professional newspaper or make a good broadcast. In that is in spite of you are not free to expose certain wrongdoings. I think has that uh, satisfied you? Uh -huh. Somebody, uh, Deng, Deng Deng. Okay, my question. Between December 1991 and April 1992, why France journalists were alone to SPLA what area and give recording to do, to record and give them to Katu? No, I'm not sure about what you are talking about. What, what happened? In 1991, 92. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> can, 
Uh, where where are you? Can I? That was the first uh, what I was reading before. Can uh, can you keep your question for a while? I want to answer that uh, question the, uh, about the French. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he was saying, why did French journalists? He was saying, why did French journalists? Uh, why did they 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 give uh, a recording to Khartoum between 1991-1992? What what a type of recording was that? Now, uh, then, Jot, if you are listening, please uh, uh, expand on your question. Give us more details. You, you could just... Uh, Peter Luan. Yeah. So, can, you, can you allow him yeah. to ask a question directly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not coming? Okay, so okay. In the meantime, in mm -hmm. the meantime, uh, yeah. I think yeah. somebody asked. Somebody mm -hmm. what? Uh, I would love you to, uh, to to clarify something. There was mm -hmm. a, there was a, an SPL soldier called uh, uh, Wek Panyin Agot. Yeah. Okay. Then Maduta Akeda Kron would love for you to confirm whether whether he was a reporter, whether he was a journalist, and if you can remember. Uh, call. Uh, it is called Commander. Peter Wek Panyin Agot. He was a commander. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Hmm. yeah, Peter Wek. Uh, yeah, Wek. Uh, he, was, he, was he was with me. He was, uh, he was a very, very good uh, uh, human being. I remember. He, you know, when I... Uh, when the radio was offered to the SPLA. I was still, uh, I was in, in the UK. I was studying there uh, for a master's in journalism and uh, which the, the, uh, the dissertation I wrote was on the, the, the role of broadcasting uh, with a special reference to Sudan. And that's where I got uh, my master's. So by that time, when I came, uh, the SPLA had selected some of the officers, most of them NCOs, and this one was, uh, I think it was a captain or a Mulazi Mawal. Uh, this, he was one of the, the staff. I think he was the number two in seniority of those who had been trained in Bill Farm before I came. So when I came from the UK, we went to refugee camp in uh, Etang, where most of the people were staying. And then we visited uh, Bill Farm, which was the SPLA general headquarters, not far from Etang, and then Bonga. I found Peter work with some of the other people, like uh, uh, somebody, Bolicha Ward, uh, Jog Yusuf, Ngor, uh, there were uh, about seven, eight, eight of them. They had been trained uh, by Ethiopians, some for Arabic section, some for English. Now, when uh, when we took them to to our station as members of our staff, we found that they had not been properly trained. They were not trained properly. Peter had a problem. I don't know how to describe it. They, they call uh, my something. There is that feeling when you are uh, reading the news, you imagine that millions of people are listening to you and these people are criticizing you. So you, you, you feel threatened or you, you are too shy. I think it has something to do with uh, um, introvert people. Uh, they, they call it uh, Mike fever. They fear that everybody is watching them and they don't like that. Peter had that problem. But as a person, as far as I remember, he was one of the best people, very friendly, very kind. He had no problem with anybody. And he knew his job very well. 
and he could do a good job. But once he went to the studio with the, he would shiver. So he was withdrawn. And then he went, uh, he was uh, sent to the general headquarters. And from the general headquarters, he, he was deployed to Baragaza. And unfortunately, he, he died there. Uh, he was a great person. And even in what I'm writing about radio as well, I really remember him as one of the closest people to me who was working with me. I lost him a lot. Uh, then we had somebody man managing, uh, yeah, Uncle Bolita Wood was also one of uh, our staff. Uh, then, uh, uh, how do you call it? Somebody you use it more. Uh, who, unfortunately, most of these people are not alive. Most of them have died. You know, those of Theophilus uh, from the the one who was in charge of English and Bari, and you had uh, many, many of them are not alive. Marundut Kat and others. So, you, so mm. is that a, who was it to you? And who, the who was, Marun, was Marundut Kat to you? Marundut Kat was, uh, I think Marundut, by the way, I, I picked some people for the job they were going to do on Radio SL. When, for example, when I um, I was attending the graduation of what they call Corium. Corium was a, a division uh, made up of 12,000 12, people. So while the, the graduation ceremony was going on, the John Garang uh, was talking in Arabic, uh, Colloquial Arabic. So he asked one of the the Noir fellows to do the interpretation to the soldiers who were uh, Noir speakers who did not understand Arabic. So Marumrut Kat, who was by that time was Mullah uh, Sani, second lieutenant, uh, uh, was was asked to come and do the interpretation. And he did it very well. And I could hear him talking, oh, wow, God, all these sort of things. And I found in him to be a very good communicator. I said this, is, I went to John Garang later, and I said, this, I, would, I would like to take this person to go and be in charge of the NOER program, because we had planned to have uh, programs in in Noel, in Shulu, in Bari, in Zandi, in Dinga, in Lotuko, six languages. Of course, we could not accommodate all the languages of South Sudan. These people were able to come and produce programs in, uh, there was somebody called Theopolis Loga. He was in Bari, for Bari. Morum Rutkar was for, uh, the, 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 for the Noe. Uh, somebody called Michael Ban uh, was for uh, Shiro, and then there was somebody for Lotoka, I don't remember. We did not have a single Zandi there to come and broadcast in Zandi. And later on, we were being blamed by some people. Why do you not broadcast in Zandi? We said, but we don't have a single Zandi in the SPLA at that time. The SPLA was the only time the, we had people from Zandi, uh, speakers of Zandi language, where after Western Equatoria was taken over by the SPL. So we had five languages. Morundu Kat was broadcasting in, in, the, in, in Noel. And before that, he, we introduced him to, to do things in uh, classical, in colloquial Arabic. And this is where he came with the program on fire map for our, the leaders with the with the leader with the the revolutionaries. It was a very popular program and all this. So that was Marun Rutkat. He was from um, he, he was from Pangat. He's uh, he's also not with us unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. But, uh... 
what, 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 what do you think is the best uh, 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 medium or the best uh, media for, uh, you know, to educate uh, South Sudanese and why? Yeah, considering that the majority of South Sudanese, uh, the literacy rate in South Sudan, and you check those uh, facts from um, the UNICEF, I mean, the United Nations. This, UNESCO. UNESCO. Yeah. Uh, UNICEF, yeah, UNESCO and UNICEF for the children of the uh, education of children. You will get that we have the the highest level of illiteracy, people who don't write and read. And in that situation, newspapers will not be suitable for them, even if they were written in their languages. They need they need uh, radio. Because radio, when I broadcast in Tinka, somebody will understand it. In Bari, they will understand. You don't need to be literate in order to understand what the radio is uh, telling you. Radio uh, has been proved a long time ago, and it does not even need research, that this is the best medium for countries where there is high illiteracy. Uh, what happens is, even those days when uh, Radio Ultraman was broadcasting to the South, they were doing it in, uh, they were doing it in, in, in Southern languages so that the ordinary people could understand. Now, <clears throat> Kenya has a system where they organize the news in Nairobi, the capital. This news item is, say, for example, let, let us take the case of South Sudan. When you talk about the need for communities, what they call tribes, to live in harmony with one another, if there is such a message, then you write it, you give it. Uh, in Kenya, they give it to in Luo, in Kikuyu, in uh, Kalanchin, and all their languages. The same we can, and I wanted this thing last time that it should be applied because. You get that message. In Jongole, you will use uh, you will use uh, Mule, Anywa, Noe, Dinka. Only four languages. Oh no, there are other people like Keshipo. You will that same message will go to all these uh, ethnic groups in their mother tongue. So you are educating the people there. Tell them. It's good to live in peace with your neighbor. Tell them, say, for example, like the people in part of Jongle where there used to be this water, what they call Guinea worm, friendit. Now, you tell people that this thing can be avoided by boiling water, by not walking in the stagnant water. Once you avoid these things, boil your water so that the, the, the worm which creates this thing is killed. Don't walk there, you will not get the, the guinea worm. I think some of you, people people like Peter Lual, I think they know what a guinea worm is. It's a terrible thing. It boils into your skin, into your body, and it comes out, a white sort of thing. And when you try to pull it, it breaks, and it continues growing, and it makes people miserable. Uh, mosquitoes, which cause malaria. You tell people, yeah, Jama, get mosquito nets. When it is dark, get into the mosquito net. Mosquitoes will not bite you. And if they don't bite you, you will not get malaria. This is also contributing into health. And it can be done by radio broadcasting, whether from Juba or from Jongle, I mean from Bor, or from Ayut, or from wherever. This can be done. And I'm talking from experience. <clears throat> Radio Juba, during the 70s, the time when we were there, had what they called the Inubenek, between me and you. It was done in uh, colloquial Arabic. It would create a story, whether true or not, but at least to send a message. One example, one example of the stories was a certain lady was reported to have put money, uh, banknotes, 
in her house. And the house was hot, I mean, grass patch. The, then she went out. The house, the, the hut got fire and she lost her money. Then she came crying, really, what is happening? Oh, Guru Shri, my money got banned. Then somebody said, my sister, well, I, if you should have, uh, you should have taken it to the bank. Because in the bank there, it will be there and it is your money. Anytime you want to go get it, you go and get whatever you want and leave the rest there safe. The bank will, and if the bank gets banned, it will compensate you. This was education. And this is what our people, ordinary people want. Uh, radio is more for the society, what they call uh, developing countries rather than for the educated people for, uh, who know what to do about their everyday life. Uh, so we need radio to talk about peace and in their language, not in English, not in Arabic, because the people in rural areas, most of them don't understand Arabic or English. So that one, and it has to be tailored. What is that you want to tell to the people? Tell them migration to the cities is not good, acceptable because there are no jobs in the cities and there are no accommodations. So you stay in the countryside, look after your cattle, grow your buffer, grow your grain. You tell them through the radio, the ships will go and communicate it to them. Uh, this one, this public education can be effectively carried out by radio. Even the peace talks, the, 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 the peace agreement can be translated into the languages understood by the people, not English or Arabic, because the majority of people don't understand these uh, foreign languages. Well, uh, thanks, Robert. I, I will give uh, Manuan the chance to, to ask a question. Manuan, mm -hmm. welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tiers, uh, for the chance. And thank you, Peter Lual, for creating this meeting. It's really educational. Uncle uh, Atem Yaga Tem, we are happy to have you on this forum, and it is really educational to all. My question is, uh, we have journalists currently in Africa, in East Africa, and in South Sudan. And there is one unique future which is different from the old journalists and the current journalists. Uh, what do you think should be should be communicated to them? Well, thank you. There's a good. Uh, I mean, there's uh, an aspect I never thought about before. Uh, you know, if you are a journalist. You should take it as a, a career, a lifelong career, not just, uh, well, you can, you, it's a job where you get paid. If you are working for in a newspaper or a radio station, you will be paid. It's a job. But there is a difference between a job you do for a living and a job you do because you feel that this is your mission. What is the mission of uh, media? It's to inform, educate, entertain. These are supposed to be the main roles of <clears throat> Entertain means <clears throat> like radio station playing music, uh, newspaper, caring. And I think people like this, they will understand the meaning of uh, entertainment. When you write something interesting, which entertains people, people laugh. And laughter is said to be a good, good, good for your health. Uh, say, for example, uh, some of you might have read uh, pieces by somebody called Victor Logala. Uh, he's a very famous uh, journalist, and he makes he, whatever he writes, he really makes you laugh. He used to run a column in what they call Sudan Sudan Mirror. They call uh, Shoe Shine Boy. He would make fun of things, and everybody would rush for that. And the first thing column they would read was the Chu Shine Boy. This is a good uh, part of the journalism, entertainment. 
with the media, with the radio or TV, music or in the dancing or all these sort of things. Education, uh, in the sense of like what I gave before about the Sudan, new Sudan Council of Churches telling people how to manage their affairs and their life. Uh, education in the sense of somebody could come and uh, write an article about, uh, say for example, traditional values. Uh, are some of our traditional values uh, good? Can we keep them? Can we abandon them? That person is contributing towards educating the people. Uh, may, you may disagree with them, but at least this is an attempt to enlighten the public. Informing people about what happened. Of course, during this time when there is what they call glut, glut in the media, information is available everywhere on your phone, mobile phone, um, computer. There's too, too, too much information to the, to the point of saturation. You don't even need it. But in the past, it was very important. Uh, it, say for example, uh, to say certain area, there is this con uh, contagious disease. It would alert the health authorities to go and rescue the people. If it is a disease which can also be infectious, people will avoid, people will be told to avoid going there. So information can also uh, help individuals for safety, for whatever. And also knowledge of what is happening. Like the stories we are getting, uh, somebody shooting people, why, why, what is it? And so on. So media is important. But what you put there has to be done in a very, very professional way. No excitement, no incitement to, to violence or to preach hatred. No, that's not information. Information should be something which, this is a fact, it has happened. Just like when you say the sun rises from the east to the west, it's a fact. Uh, opinions which try to create problems should not be part of journalism. It has to be a contribution to harmony, a, a society where rights of others are expected. And if there is somebody trying to disrupt peace, it must, must also be exposed that this is happening and this should be stopped. And this is the work of the police, for example. Not, not to send people to go and lynch them, no. So still we have radio and uh, newspapers which are relevant. Uh, is, they are now being threatened by social media. But it is not the social media, like the gun. The gun does not shoot people. It is the person pulling the trigger is the one responsible. So what, what prevents people from, say for example, uh, why don't you send a photograph of your graduation? I have graduated from university. This is good news for your friends and family. Oh, so-and-so has got a child, a baby. Oh, this is good news. It is supposed to be for carrying positive information, not destructive, not hatred. This is no longer the work of media. If, it is, if people think that this is the role of media, then they are talking about something else. Yeah. Well, uh, th thank you. My, my, thank you. My last question is, uh, in East Africa, many, many people are not reading. Majority of the youth are not reading. There's lack of readability among the youth. What they do is to play games on their phones. That's one. Two, in, in, in Australia and abroad, you have written books, the same to Tiesa Yuen and me. But people are not buying books. African mm -hmm. World Book has been struggling on this. Yeah. How do we bring our community back to read books? Uh, that's one. Two, mm -hmm. uh, you have narrated more on the liberation struggle. 
but our people are now being lost day by day and they have no written books for the young generation how will we convince them to, to write books thank you thank you tears that the last yeah thank you <laughs> the question is a bit complicated because <clears throat> South Sudan, uh, I think you you knew somebody called uh, William Buell, Connor Buell. Yes, yes, I know. Okay, he, he used to, he had a way, he said South Sudan or Southern Sudanese at the time were uh, uh, an oral society, oral meaning Everything is passed by the word of mouth, not documented. Somebody will say, so and so did this thing, and this thing never happened. And then somebody picks that and go and relates that thing, and it goes on and on, and it has no foundation. And this is the way people are communicating. But if you challenge this person, where can I get this information, the source of this information? That person will not tell you. But, for example, in your book, if you have uh, made a statement and people begin to argue about it, then you say, go and look, uh, in the go to the library, you will find books X with this. This is documented things are more reliable than what you hear from other people. And this is why you have seen Khawaja ahead of us in terms of going back to things which happened many, many years back. What we have is what we got from our parents, from our, and from their grand, from their parents and grandparents, and it goes on. And with the telling of the story, which is not documented, sometimes it loses its value. There is what they call the Chinese what where people were telling people to one from from the beginning something and at the end it began not turn out to be different from the original word because in the telling something gets lost so we need documented evidence uh, when did this thing happen and who was there uh, it was recorded by so and so okay where is it in the archives in the book everything our archives are in a very bad shape. Most of the documents, including the things about the liberation movement, are circulating in the world. Some papers have disappeared. I'm even sure some of the documents of John Garang are not available. So how do we know what was happening then? Those people who have tried to document these things for the present generation and for the future, people are not ready to read. We don't love reading. This is a fact. As South Sudanese, the people who love reading are very few. It is a habit, a habit. Some people, people, you know, if you make it your habit, you will not have any problem or boredom. Uh, it will keep you busy, especially if you, if you are reading good books. And it increases your knowledge about the world. I mean, not everything written is useful. Maybe there are parts we will not agree with. But all the same read. And it also increases your age. It keeps you up to date. Because language is even changing. The style somebody uses also, uh, you can borrow it. But the majority of people don't like reading. And even when you reduce the price of your books, even if you sell them for $25, and somebody is... Uh, making what they call uh, Harambe for whatever. Let me, let us think of, uh, for... Uh, um, uh, for raising? Uh, for raising for, uh, I don't know. Let us think of something which is not valuable, of, of, of no value. They will, they will go and pay even thousands of dollars for that thing rather than buying this cheap book. Because they don't see the value of it. And even if they buy, by the way, they will not eat. It's a habit which is cultivated from 
even uh, student days. It becomes difficult the, the order you get, and you have not developed that as a habit. There is no way you can just sit for a day or for hours trying to finish a book. It is not one of our values. And it has become so, especially during the only time of the liberation movement, we were very few people were reading. People were not reading. And then well, those who had the opportunity to be educated, to, to be in schools, up to university, after getting their degrees, that's enough. They think that that knowledge they obtain is enough forever. But they don't know that everything is everything is changing. If it is medicine, it's, you need to be up to date. If it is everything, science, even the arts, language itself, the English we used to know in the 60s and the 50s, 70s, it's no longer, some of the things are no longer, they have changed. For example, you used to talk about he, when you the, 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 according to lawyers, everything is he. Somebody, if he do, if he does this, he will be punished. Forgetting that uh, the females are part of human society. So later on, they have to say, no, in the state of uh, discriminating women, let us talk of they. If somebody has left the car there and not properly parked. And if you found, if you find them, re them refer to one person whether a female or male, just to avoid this question of he or she. In our days, it used to be he. And this is different discrimination against women, and so on. Certain words also we used to be, which are now considered to be offensive. For example, during the 60s, they used to talk of Negro for a black person. Now it's an insult. How do you get this? You get it from reading, from writing. Because People write according to the thinking of the day and all this. Knowledge of the the, uh, the southern history, uh, the SPLA, the what, are all in the books. And even some of you had been denied. I mean, it was not your mistake. To, to go to school in Kenya, you had to read uh, East African history or Kenyan history, Australia history. Wherever you have your education, that's the history you read. But you don't know the history of South Sudan. And where is it? There are books. Read them. And history of South Sudan and Sudan are one and the same. And the books are there. Those of uh, Douglas Johnson, those of uh, uh, Robert Collins, they're there. So this is a real problem. The question of lack of interest in reading. And I don't know what appeal you can make to change people's mind about that. Especially now with the social media taking time of so many people. Uh, even you find two people uh, on a table going for coffee in a shop. Instead of ch chatting, everybody is busy with their uh, phone. So why did they have to go there? It's, it's a problem. And I don't think I have a solution for that. Yeah. Well, uh, we are we we are about to end the show, but uh, a couple of more questions for you. Mm -hmm. They are coming from from our viewers. Uh, one, yeah. uh, somebody. This is Kira Kira Jackbon is asking why mm -hmm. your 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 column, why you name your 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 column back then, a man far away from home. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I explained it in the. In my book last time. They uh, must what, they have not read it. <laughs> mm, yeah, what happened was there there was a an SPLM newsletter called uh, Updates. By that time I uh, I was contributing a column. Everything was about war. A report from the war front about clashes between the government and the SPLM forces. And people writing condemning cartoon, people writing about everything about about war. And it came to me, why is it all the time about war? Is there nothing else going on in the life of people? Uh, people are 
living normal life apart from the, the world there's war but people are marrying people are producing children people are doing this and all this so i said in order to and i had realized that the kawajar were bought in nairobi they were the main consumers they were bought by this sort of we have killed this many people we were done this the enemy is on the run and all this and condemnation of our doom policies and all this So when I introduce this, that at least let us have a break, something different from war. Is there nothing else happening apart from war? Definitely, there, there are things. There were there were things happening outside war. So I came up with this concept to break the monotony, because it, it is not everybody who would like to read that some sort of thing. Can you believe? Yeah. the demand for the newspaper went up because these people who like to read oh, oh how the dinga culture people are okay uh, men are not supposed to cook men are not supposed to milk cows huh? why why because there was this distribution of job i mean the division of uh, job women take care of the what you bring to when you say for example if you go to hand and bring the the, the meat of the whatever once you give it to the lady there it is her responsibility to prepare it for everybody don't go and see how it was cooked or how it is distributed or who will get which chair uh men also and the women the, the i mean the hard job like hunting would be done by men fishing by men once it is brought the food brought home they show over and this is the job of ladies you should you shouldn't interfere with that people were learning about this thing. they didn't know and so on. and i was writing about so many things even the think of their lives in those days when we were kids which today even some of you might have not known young people going to chat with girls in the countryside they would travel through the dark forest and there were animals wild animals and all this in order to go to there used to be what they call huts for girls sisters or cousins would be having uh, their, their hut separate from the one of the parents and the brothers and all this. now these young people coming they would be seated they would be given part of the, the hut and the girls separate them and they would spend the whole night chatting This is what they call gop uh, and this is where people realize which girl they would like to marry and all this they were surprised because this was educating these people about the customs the the thing of society of the day so it was something to break this uh, monotonous sort of uh, war war killing killing <coughs> talk about other things well So that was the origin of the thing. <clears throat> oh, th- thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, the the most talked about the uh, uh, issue today uh, mm-hmm. amongst also me all over the world. Yeah, is uh, is uh, the dredging of, of 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 one of the rivers or whatever they are about to do. Everyone's talking about it. The government is talking about it. The Nubian are talking about it. Whatever they are. Somebody called uh, Jacob Petro would like to to know your comment, your view, what you tell us on it about this. And before and and and, and you answer it before you say your last comment. Mm-hmm. What do you think about about the dredging? What is your 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 comment about about the dredging of Nam River? Yeah, you see the you were talking before about the media not being free uh that the journalists are not uh writing as they should uh i'm sure if people are writing about uh, i mean asking questions about this in juba in the newspapers there it's likely to get you into trouble but that's exactly what the newspaper is supposed to do to bring up issues of the day for discussion uh also to ask the members of uh, legislative assembly which is the law making body to ask the government what is this thing happening why is it being done 
Why are we not informed? Why is the public not informed? Uh, I'm supposed to be telling you and others uh, what is happening, but <laughs> unfortunately, I'm an interested party. I'm an interested party in the sense that there is no transparency in these things. Because when the machines for dredging were brought into the area, people started asking, how did they come? Who, who was behind this? And uh, the people who brought them are members of the government, government in Juba and government in Bentiu. And now part of the government are saying they didn't know. They have no idea about how they came. This is why I'm saying uh, I'm not a neutral person. Because such a situation should not be allowed to develop. The government is supposed to be one body. If I am a minister and I go and sign an agreement and I'm not authorized, this is uh, unacceptable. I can be sacked. And now they say the minister went and signed that without authorization. It raises a lot of questions, but of course that's not uh, that's not where we have to discuss it. This is where I'm in. Uh, I, I'm a member of a forum where some of these things are discussed, and I give my opinion there. And my, I agree with people who say there is a lot of concern that dredging. This is making the river deeper. Uh, will make the water which spills outside the, the river come back to the mainstream and flow normally. According to scientists, I'm, I'm not one of them, but I believe them. This water which spills out of the river is sometimes it evaporates. It goes into the atmosphere. And this is the one which forms rain in other areas. And they say the equatorial forest, the one which is in the Congo and even part of Equatoria, is a result of this. Once there is no spill water, rains will become less and the place will become desert. And they cite uh, many places like Chad. Lake Chad now is drying up. There's also, uh, I've seen a document I mean, a video of uh, Lake Baikal in uh, the former Soviet Union in Russia drying up. These things are not just fiction. They are credible, I mean, from science, the stories from scientists, and we have to trust them. What, under normal circumstances, should be done would be to conduct research. Research conducted by independent people who should not be biased in favor of this or... Uh, so people say, this one is not acceptable. This is what I'm reporting about what we discussed on, on that forum. And some people have gone to the point of raising this to the, the court, high court in uh, East African community in Arusha. This is no longer a question of uh, we, uh, we disagree with this and therefore it should end like that. Some people have been suggesting that it should be taken to the National Legislative Assembly because normally the lawmaking body, the parliament, is supposed to ask the government, that's their job, why is this thing happening in all this, to be explained. And if they find that this is not the right thing to do, they will block it. They will say, no, it cannot be done. But like the media, the, the parliament we have has not been doing that job. And uh, if they were to block it, like the regional assembly in uh, the, the old days, when uh, Khartoum wanted to take part of Bentiu to the north, they raise it in Juba and uh, they block it. 
And uh, when it was taken to the university, did the parliament of Israel say no? Then we should not go away. So parliament has power to check the activities of the government. If they disagree with the government and they, the majority of them agree, then the whole thing should not go ahead. Uh, as also, uh, from a journalistic point of view, I wouldn't advocate anything which would lead to violence. But people should convince the government this one is not good because of this and this. Well, there are scientists talking about this. The government is also has the government has the right to convince the people why this is good and not good. Uh, like the Jungle Lake Canal. <clears throat> the Jungle Lake Canal uh, was stopped by the SKL. Uh There were people talking about that the regional government of the day was behind the Jungle Lake Canal. That's not true. It was agreed between Nimeri, President Nimeri, and Anwar al-Sadat of Egypt. When Nimeri visited Egypt, they had what they call integration. The, the, the two countries were trying to have some sort of economic cooperation and all these sort of things. And Egyptians have always been asking for the, the, Nile, the waters from the Nile for their irrigation. Nobody denies Egypt the right to use the water because uh, they say you have read that Egypt is the gift of the Nile. If you stop the water going to Egypt, they will perish. They don't have rains like what we have. But this water belongs to the countries through, through which it passes, Ethiopia. Much of the water from the Blue Nile comes from Ethiopia, Highlands. The water from the White Nile, it comes from uh, Great Lakes region, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, through Lake Victoria, uh, Congo, and ourselves. This water collects and runs with the, it's our water. So that is what they call the, the, Nile, the Nile water basin countries. That includes uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, Egypt, and those countries I have mentioned. It's their property. It's a shared property. There is no reason why Egypt and, and Sudan should insist that they get the, the back majority of the water. And if anybody wants to make them hydroelectric, like the one in the, around Nimali, Egypt say no, as if the water belongs to them alone. Uh, this is completely unacceptable. The Nile Waters Agreement was done in 1929 between Sudan and Egypt. Egypt was a partner with the British in ruling the Sudan. So we, the Sudanese, North and South, we did not have the voice. Even if we didn't want it, there was no way we could stop it. So it was uh, done. In 1959, another one, another agreement was signed, which resulted in the, the, the Swan Dam being higher built, uh, higher Swan Dam being built. And by the way, this dam uh, took over the Nub this area called Nubia in northern Sudan, which was a historical place where you had even Christian churches which were there before for Islam. It went underwater, and the people were told to move to the east. It has been doing a lot of damage. Nyerere had what they call uh, the doctrine of uh, if an agreement was made before you were an independent country, that agreement does not bind on you. So the Waters Nile Agreement of 1929 and 1959, to us, we in South Sudan are not binding on us. Of course, some people say, some lawyers say that one is being questioned, that doctrine. But again, why is it that Egypt is interested in the water which belongs to all of us, and they want to exclude us from. If it is the question of floods, there are ways of uh, controlling floods. Nobody is against it, 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 it does damage, but it can be managed. The, there has been already work going on that the, the, the dash could come and build dikes in uh, areas like Bor. Once those dikes are there, the flood will not be there. 
And once the canal is dug, the water will go and the sap will dry up. Sap is one of the rare uh, natural features and it is uh, what they call world heritage. Uh, how do you call it? Exactly. Now, we, the South Sudanese, the owners of the thing, we have not even made it a natural uh, site, heritage site. Now, when, once the canal is uh, built, the water will just go. And the, 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 the sand will dry up. Why, why do we destroy ourselves? This is my personal opinion. And uh, maybe there are people who, and there are a lot of people who share this opinion. If it is done under the pretext that it is going to relieve people from the floods, that's not a solution. It's, it's, a, it's a solution to create a bigger problem, drying up the sand and reducing the amount of rainwater we have. Uh, we need, as far as the problem of the flooding, as far as the uh, Bora area, I mean, Dongle is concerned, people go to highlands. There are a lot of uh, highlands around the area. Uh, I wouldn't advocate people going to Victoria. You just go to the nearest highland and settle there for the time being until the, the floods will recede. Uh, these are controversial matters. But they need to be discussed and backed by scientific. Uh, then somebody called Majok Chol, Chol Majok, uh, is studying in the UK, has done a lot of uh, research on this work. These are the things which should be read and used in defending uh, positions like why do we need the jungle canal completed? Uh, what 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 is that? Thing that we will gain from Egypt by offering our own livelihood to them. Why? Anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry to have been personal. Uh, yeah, right, to thanks. add a little, to add a mm -hmm. little, TSUN, uh, yeah. there's, there's a professor here at the University of Nairobi who mm -hmm. was chatting with me last week and he was talking about the, the measurement of volume of water being lost from the Nile. He mm -hmm. said Nile discharged mm -hmm. 244 million of cubic meters of water per day. Yeah. And if Yongulei Canal was to be built, mm -hmm. then the estimation is 30 million cubic meters per day, mm -hmm. giving a total dis discharge of 274 million cubic meters per day. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. downstream. Yeah. And if this is to continue for six months without precip precipitation, mm -hmm. it will go. 5,400 million cubic meters, mm -hmm. and it will be lost, and the suit will definitely dry up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, yeah, I've been corrected here about the the Deng Majung Chol. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you young people, uh, I I like that most of you are really doing science. Uh, these areas of science are, you know, the the development of the Western world had really a lot to do with technology. When they embrace technology, they have been able to do things like, okay, you see the aircraft, just a small thing, but just a machine flying, it's, it's a miracle. And people going to the moon and all, this simple and through science. So that knowledge, like those people who are giving us, like the information they are giving us now about the evaporation, the amount of water and all this, these are the things you really used to, used to deploy in supporting your argument. Because if you say, we don't want water to go to Egypt, it will, it will sound as if we are, uh, I don't know the right word, people without humanity, don't not caring about the welfare of others. It's not the thing. It's, Somebody has even sent a message there, an existential uh, threat, something threatening our own existence as human, as people living in that particular part of the world. So knowledge of science and its application is what we really need. And especially you now in the West, you have all the facilities to do anything. 
Uh, I'm not saying that we should go to Mars, but there is a thing I used to give to example to uh, people coming from Africa. There is on the way from Sydney here to a place called Gosford where I was staying, there is a range of uh, hills. You cannot go there by, by the, the cars cannot make, it, it's a block. So what they did was to, to dig a tunnel beneath the, 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 the hills. So the cars and the trains, they pass under. But without that, you will not go there until maybe you can go by, by flying. This is technology. And this is what we need, we need to apply when we are arguing about why we don't want dredging, why we don't want the jungle economy to be completed. If it, like the way you are reasoning and others, is convincing. But if you say, I don't want it, tell me why. There must be an answer to every why. And thank you for your uh, scientific information you are providing. Um, Uncle Atem, uh, yeah. is there anything you would love to add? There's maybe something I didn't, I didn't ask. Anything? Well, the media uh, people, uh, I don't think they, they, they have to be frank. Especially, I'm talking about the people in Juba. They really need to to admit that they, what they are doing is not journalism. Well, there could be a few cases here and there. Everybody I, I talk with by phone from Juba, and when I ask them, do you read the newspapers? We don't read. Why? No. So discouraging. The standards are so low. And somebody says, when you read one of these newspapers, it gives you a headache. It's not that they are not uh, questioning the government activities or what. It's the presentation. There's no professionalism. And this one does not need, it does not need money. You need somebody, like what they call AMDIS. AMDIS, we, 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 I was one of the founders of this organization. Because we, we said, look, when the war is over, there will be, we will need to establish a democratic system. And one of these pillars of democracy is uh, the media. They call it the fourth estate. Estate is the, the branch. The first is the government, which is the executive, the, uh, the legislature, which is the parliament, judiciary, and this, the media. The media is supposed to to be what they call the watchdog. See, whatever branch is not doing its job properly for the welfare of the society. Now, if the media is not doing the job, of course, as uh, T.S. Uh, said before, because they are not free, that's why they cannot do it. Okay, why can they not do what the government is not preventing them from doing? Get the professional standards. Get the professional standards. Even if they hire people from the US or from the UK to come and train them there on the job, they will get it. Even the news which is not up to the expectation of the readers, at least there might be somebody writing like my, my column, uh, far away from war. I, I could have my own column to educate foreigners in Cuba about South Sudan. Uh, somebody like Victor will be entertaining people with his jokes. The same with the TSA UN. We need a professional media, whether there is democracy or no democracy. I think that's the uh, answer to your question. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, this is going to the listeners, though you are part of it. Uh, it is an announcement from Africa World Book. Next Saturday, uh, uh, Veteran General Entertainment himself will uh, interview uh, Francis Demajo on, on his new book, The Invisible Bridge. So we would love to invite you to, to, to watch, uh, participate, ask questions about, about the book. I think the book was, was, uh, was, 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 was printed when? In 2020? Some, mm -hmm. some must have already read it. So 
it is an announcement. Be prepared and, and let's support them. Let's go ask them questions. They are, they are living uh, uh, libraries. Mm -hmm. or, uh, someone would call them the encyclopedia. So let's prepare ourselves and, and support them next Saturday. And, and this, this has a uh, as for, this has brought us to the end of this show. Thanks to everyone, Uncle Tim. Yeah. See you on Saturday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Last word. Oh, okay. Yeah. Last word. Uh -huh. Um. You see, they say, uh, they, there are jobs people don't retire from. When it's, it's good to be called veteran, somebody who has been doing something in the past and uh, is no longer doing it. Uh, I consider myself as, as an active journalist. If I'm not writing, it is not that uh, I have given up. It's, I have not got, I have not got the right medium. Uh, uh, even I was asking people in Cuba, Cuba, all the places, if there is a newspaper which has good editor, I will be right. I will be. I will start a column. Journalists don't retire. Uh, I'm an active journalist up to now, and also for your information and for the, the listeners everywhere. I'm not a politician. I hate politics, and this is why I've never joined any organization after the independence of South Sudan. You remember how many organizations are there, anti-government, anti, or for the government? No. I'm an independent person, politically speaking. But I have very strong opinions. Like the general economy, for me, it should not be that. It would uh, destroy the, the wetland. Which is not very far from my home area, by the way. Yeah, so that's a piece of information. I'm still with you as a, a journalist. It's that I'm not appearing frequently all these days because there's no good news. But let the, if there's a good news about you now, I will send my piece tomorrow. That's, uh, that's for you, uh, PSA event. And thank you very much. I enjoyed your company. I learned a lot from you, by the way. You, uh, you people wow. with uh, background in science. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Latin. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>
Children read. 